Yes, I'm going to talk about some connections between gravity and quantum mechanics. They're familiar to many of you, but I want to draw a lesson that goes further than most of you may be prepared to accept. That in some sense, GR, gravity, is equal to quantum mechanics. I also claim that quantum gravity is close to being an experimental subject that can be done in an ordinary low energy laboratory. I want to take a broader view and think of a wider class of things that we would call gravity. In particular, for example, um, ADS-CFT for a relatively small Tuft coupling would not be well described by ordinary general relativity, but I think we might still call, call it part of the general framework of gravitation. In any case, it's been said that, the, that, the hydro, that the gravity is the hydrodynamics of entanglement. If that's so, then whenever entanglement occurs in sufficient concentration, gravitation will also be present. We may go further and say that just as hydrodynamics is rooted in the behavior of individual particles, even very small quantum systems must, must exhibit certain primitive forms of gravity. I don't mean the uh, gravitational attraction between electrons. That is not what I mean by that statement. When these ordinary systems have enough interaction and entanglement, they ha behave gravitationally. I claim they're not models of gravity or simulations of gravity. They are gravity. The implication is profound. Quantum gravity can be studied in ordinary laboratories as soon as it becomes feasible to control entanglement. In other words, as soon as reliable quantum computers become available. I'll illustrate this viewpoint with some simple examples based on ER equals EPR and what Adam and I call the second law of complexity. None, none of them depend on having Planck energy particles, huge amounts of mass, or incredibly long time scales. ER is Einstein-Rosen bridges. That means gravity, Einstein equations, and so forth. EPR is basically quantum mechanics. And in each example, there will be two sides like that. And I want to demonstrate that there's a lot of similarity, a lot of overlap, and a lot of um, basically one is very similar or perhaps the same as the other. So let's begin with the operational meaning of an Einstein-Rosen bridge. First of all, Einstein-Rosen bridges are classical general relativity solutions, but they're fundamentally quantum objects. They only occur when there's entanglement, and creating one always involves quantum mechanics. Two, quantum mechanically, an Einstein-Rosen bridge can be explored. Its properties studied and reported on. Now, that doesn't make it very special. This room can be explored. Somebody can come in the door, look around, go back out and report what he sees. So that's not in itself special, but you might have expected, and certainly most of us did expect, that Einstein-Rosen bridges were not that way, that they could not be explored. Uh, once you're in, you're in, and you can't get out. But that seems to be wrong. Three, messages, and this is the important thing, this is the very special thing. Messages can be perfectly securely transmitted from the vicinity of one object, one end of the Einstein-Rosen bridge to the other, without leaving any trace in the laboratory space between them. That is unusual in classical physics. It never happens. Anything, even my waving my finger around, creates gravitational waves, and the gravitational waves in purely classical physics in every little volume of space will carry all of the information about how my finger wiggled, if you had the sufficient sensitivity to measure it. OK, so the, the last thing is the important thing, that perfectly secure messages can be sent without leaving any trace in the laboratory between, in the region between the two uh, ends. In other words, we could call it teleportation through the wormhole. This is not possible classically namely perfectly secure um, communication. So let me begin with uh, teleportation. And now I'm thinking about the simplest form of teleportation, two qubits, just to illustrate that, there, that the concept that we're going to use later when we think about gravity is already inherent in the theory of two qubits. Let me just remind you about teleportation. If you didn't know it, you probably won't get it from this, but I'll tell you anyway. Alice and Bob share a bell pair. Alice also is in control of another qubit called Tom. T is the thing which is going to be teleported. Alice and Bob have 
the pure state 0, 0, plus 1, 1. What do we do? We take Alice's share of the entangled pair, combine it with Tom, and make a measurement. The measurement is in the Bell basis. The Bell basis is one of four possible states, and the purpose of the measurement is to project onto one of the four possible Bell states. I call that little a. And once that's been done, Alice then sends a mes message to Bob in the form of two classical bits. Once Tom gets the message, he applies an operator. He applies a unitary operator. Uh, if you want to keep track of it, these are sigma matrices and so forth, but that's not terribly important. He applies an operator, and if he does it correctly, the Tom qubit will appear at his end in exactly the state that it came in. Of course, the Tom qubit will disappear from the left-hand side. That's guaranteed by the no-cloning principle. If it appears on the right, it can't be on the left. And this kind of communication is perfectly secure because of the monogamy of entanglement. No trace, however faint, of the teleported state can be found in the space between the entangled systems. That's what makes quantum teleportation really unique and special compared to other forms of, um, of classical, classical communication. Well, then you can ask, how on earth did Tom get from A to B without leaving a trace in between? How can it be that Tom got from A to B in a way which was so secure that with all the powers in the world, it's impossible to eavesdrop on the, on the, uh, on the experiment? One answer, and I think it's a correct answer, of course, is that in quantum mechanics, information is not local, and you can't always say where information is, so you don't have to answer the question how it got from A to B. Another answer, which I find very interesting, is yes, the information did go from A to B, and it went through the wormhole, which is implicit in ER equals EPR. In other words, the Bell pair comes equipped with a proto-microscopic wormhole, and that's how Tom got from A to B. Okay, you may not be prepared to believe that, but uh, that's okay, we can, uh, we can argue it. I wanna say something else now, that we can use the same protocol, the same protocol, not to send information, but to explore the wormhole. Here's the way we would think about it. This time, instead of Tom coming in in an unknown state to be transported across the Bob, we know the state of Tom. We purposely prepare him in some state, in some given state. And the question is to explore what the state of the bell pair is. Perhaps the bell pair wasn't prepared exactly correctly. Perhaps it was a little bit off. And Alice and Bob want to know what's in that bell pair, what's in that box with a question mark. And so what they do is they do exactly the same protocol that they did before. But now, Tom will come out in a different state, in an altered state. In fact, in general, he come out in an impure state. But by interrogating the density matrix rho, inter interrogating it means make, making measurements on it, Bob can find out some information about the state WAB. And the point is, of course, we could call that exploring the wormhole. Okay, we'll come back to that theme in a moment, but first I want to invite you to come and visit Alice's non-relativistic non laboratory. What do I mean by a non-relativistic laboratory? I mean that everything that we measure, everything that we, everything that we study, necessarily has a velocity which is much, much less than the speed of light in the laboratory. And number two, that the masses of all objects are always much less than the radius of the laboratory divided by G lab. This will ensure that there are no large gravitational back reactions and that we can fundamentally ignore gravity and we can fundamentally ignore special relativity. In effect, the speed of light is infinite. Alice has in her laboratory a shell, a large spherical shell, and that shell is made of doped silicon. I don't even know what doped silicon means, but it's made of doped silicon and it's been doped in such a way as to have a zero temperature quantum critical point. In other words, it's described by a CFT, by a conformal field theory. No doubt we can build such things. The special assumption is going to be that it's a conformal field theory that has a gravity dual. That might be hard to build, but we don't know any reason 
that that can't be the case. Incidentally, to say that it's a conformal field theory, I mean that it flows in the infrared to a conformal field theory. We have an object now which, if everything we think is true about ADS-CFT, should not only have a boundary, but in some sense there must be bulk physics that goes along with it, and I'll assume that. Okay, now, the idea that it's a non-relativistic laboratory has the advantage for Alice that by the time it takes for a signal to go from one point on the sphere to another, a short distance, Alice can jump back and forth many times. <laughs> so she's unrestricted, but <laughs> you want me to do that again? <laughs> I'm not even gonna try, I'm, I, won't, I won't get it right. Okay, so she gets to be able to exceed the velocity of light on the shell. In other words, the velocity of light in the bulk theory, and she can do, therefore, anything she wants that's consistent with quantum mechanics. That's the advantage of thinking this way. Uh, things that we couldn't even imagine to be able to do with uh, astrophysical black holes, Alice can do because she has this incredible power to be able to move as fast as she likes relative to the, uh, to the shell. Let's assume Alice also has some tools. She has a light hammer that she can tap on the shell with. She can send signals, or at least uh, she can send um, signals out that correspond to low dimension operators, for example, energy momentum tensor, whatever, propagate outward from her tapping. But on the other hand, in the bulk version of the theory, if there is a bulk, and if there is a version of bulk, that will also correspond to signals propagating into the bulk. Signals propagating into the bulk that could, in principle, be detected by a bulk observer. The bulk observer may just be uh, some small system itself. On the other hand, the bulk observer, or the bulk system at the center, can respond by waving around a massive particle or whatever it wants to do, and send out signals that can be detected by Alice's stethoscope. That other thing was supposed to be a stethoscope. In principle, in this setup, it should be possible for Alice on the outside to communicate with the interior. I don't know any obstruction. Uh, the interior now, I mean the bulk, which is implied by ADS-CFT. Okay, so by communicating with the bulk observer, Alice can determine that the bulk contains gravity waves, gravitons, black holes. However, one might think that she can't probe the interior of a black hole. No signal from inside the black hole interior can reach the boundary, the shell. Well, in fact, I think that's too pessimistic. In order to give an example of why that's wrong, let's bring Bob in with his shell. Bob also has a shell. And Bob's shell and Alice's shell have been allowed to interact and become entangled. In fact, if you're clever enough, it should be possible to entangle them in the thermal field double state. If you put them into the thermal field double state, then at least from the bulk point of view, we would say that there should be a wormhole between Alice's black hole and Bob's black hole. Why? Because they're entangled from ER equals EPR. On the other hand, from the laboratory point of view, the two shells are also entangled because from the laboratory point of view, and the laboratory is also described by the laws of nature of quantum gravity and so forth, it must be that from the laboratory point of view, there is also some form of Einstein-Rosen bridge connecting them. Are these two the same? The laboratory version of the Einstein-Rosen bridge and the bulk version? Yes, I think they are. Um, I think they are the same thing. And that's what makes me think that there's some sense in which quantum mechanics of these shells is really, in some sense, genuine gravity and not some, just some simulation of it. Okay, so let's uh, go on and talk about what Alice and Bob can do with their entangled shells. In particular, they can do teleportation. We can call it teleportation through the wormhole. We start with Alice and Bob with their entangled uh, shells. We'll draw it as a wormhole. And Tom, who I've drawn as being smaller than Alice and Bob, some small number of qubits, or a relatively small number of qubits, is outside. 
Um, we can think of injecting TOM into the CFT, for example, by applying a TOM operator. Let there be a TOM operator, we operate with TOM operator, and that injects TOM into the CFT. Or we can try other ways of doing it, merging TOM state with the CFT. Um, so we throw TOM into the black hole. And then we wait a scrambling time. Waiting a scrambling time has a couple of advantages. First of all, it simplifies the mathematics of, um, of uh, teleportation. But in this case, it's doing something else. If we wait a bit of time, the wormhole will grow. As the wormhole grows, Tom is stuck at a point in the wormhole. The wormhole grows outward, and Tom winds up deeper into the Einstein-Rosen bridge than he started. And that has an advantage for him. He is protected from some very, very violent things that Alice is going to do. He's far enough away, deep enough into the, that what Alice is about to do will not hurt him. What Alice is about to do is to do a complete set of commuting measurements on her side of the black hole, on her black hole. Okay. Complete set, measure all of the qubits in the computational basis. She'll get results. The results will be a series of numbers to the extent that we can think of the black hole as made out of qubits. And Alice can record them in her notebook. Another thing that will happen as a consequence of this is that Bob's and Alice's side will become disentangled. Alice has made the measurement. She's projected onto some state. It's become disentangled. And the result is that the Einstein-Rosen bridge is snipped, cut cut at Alice's end. Bob, however, is safely inside the wormhole on Bob's side. Tom. Hmm? Tom. Tom is safe. What did I say, Bob? Yeah, Tom is safely inside. Thank you. OK, next step. Alice throws her notebook over to Bob. Bob. One thing I should say about this is that the numbers in the notebook have no correlation whatever with the state of Tom. They have none whatever. They're completely random relative to the state. In fact, they're just a bunch of random numbers. And so if Eve were to intercept the message, she finds out zero about Tom. She can destroy the message, but she can't find out anything. She throws her notebook across to Bob, and Bob does an operation in response, a particular operator he applies that depends on the result, the, that depends on what he see, reads in the notebook and out pops Tom. That's quantum teleportation, but you can call it quantum teleportation through a chaotic channel, if you like. Or you can call it quantum teleportation through a wormhole. But do keep in mind, all of this is supposedly happening in Alice's non-relativistic laboratory. This is not happening from some, uh, in some astro astronomical uh, system. It's happening in Alice's non-relativistic laboratory, uh, which is quite a remarkable fact. Now, I, uh, this slide here is just to remind you that you can use the same protocol not to transmit Tom from one side to the other, but to explore the wormhole. By that, I mean we can fix Tom in a known state, but vary a little bit from away, for example, away from the thermal field, double a little bit, throw in an extra photon or two, whatever, and the result will be that when Tom goes through the wormhole, he comes out the other side slightly modified. When interrogated, he will give different answers than he would if he went through without being jiggled by the photons or whatever. In other words, he will report that there was a photon on the inside, or in effect, report that there was a photon on the inside. And in that way, Bob and Alice will have done some kind of tomography on the wormhole itself. That seems to me very interesting. It seems to me to be a big game changer for the way we think. Five years ago, 10 years ago, whenever, I would have said wormholes are not part of the observable universe. It seems that wormholes are part of the observable universe. And uh, that seems to me a big change. OK, let me describe the same thing in the language of um, uh, Gao, uh, Jaffers, Wall, and uh, Maldacena, and Stanford, and Yang. 
basically the same setup, very similar setup. I think their setup is a little cleaner and a little nicer. Here's the picture. You all know what the square is. It's a Penrose diagram. Alice is on, on the left side. Bob is on the right side. Alice goes back in time or just starts very early and applies the Tom operator. The Tom operator is the thing that creates the red, uh, the red signal. That's Tom. She applies it, in this case, in the past at a time which is the negative scrambling time. That means that by time t equals zero, Tom will be safely away from the boundary. He'll be deep into the, uh, into the bulk, safe from anything that Alice might do. And the next step is, of course, that Alice is going to do a measurement and not just do a measurement. She's going to send the result of the measurement to the other side. On the other side, Tom is going to do something in response. And uh, this is the picture that I associate with the, uh, with the um, traversable wormhole picture, let's call it. What is this picture? This picture shows, first of all, the purple line is the exchange of the classical information uh, that, uh, that Alice has to send to Bob to carry out the teleportation protocol. And the back reaction on the Penrose diagram is to tilt it inward. Tilting it inward happens because the energy of the shock that's created by these events over there happens to be negative. That was the discovery of uh, Jow, uh, Jaffris and, uh, and Wall and commented on very beautifully by, uh, by uh, Stanford, Maldesena, and Yang. And of course, what you notice is that opens up a hole that allows Tom to go through from one side to the other. That's the traversable wormhole story, and it is very close in many ways to the uh, teleportation through the wormhole. Uh, slightly different, perhaps, but, uh, but spiritually the same. Okay, let me add something now. Let's imagine that after Tom is thrown in, we apply an operator which creates a photon, a low-energy photon, uh, we can trace the photon backward, but uh, for the moment, the photon was not there in the past. Just forget the lower uh, green line. We create a photon. The photon falls into the singularity, for example. All right, that's what happens if we apply the two operators, W and capital T, in the order first send in Tom and then send in the photon. But we can also send those operators in out of time order. We can first hit the thermal field double with W, the thermal field double with W of T, and what does that do? That creates an initial state which contains the photon, which was initially aimed out toward the boundary, but then we throw in capital T, and that intercepts the photon as the photon is going toward the boundary. The photon and Tom interact with each other the photon might get absorbed, or the photon uh, might uh, scatter Tom. One way or another, Tom will be affected by that photon and come out slightly different than had he not uh, met the photon. In fact, Tom can get entangled with a photon. If he gets entangled with a photon, Tom will come out in an impure state because he will be entangled with the rest of the black hole, with the stuff, uh, with the photon that fell into the singularity, or another way of saying it is that Tom does not get completely disentangled uh, from, the, um, from the black hole. And this I would call exploring the wormhole. Tom gets to tell Bob, I saw a photon on the inside. So this is again an example of exploring a wormhole. Okay, that's one set of examples. ER equals EPR. You can explore wormholes, you can use them to send, uh, and in fact, in this way of thinking, there's not a sharp division between what happens for a single bell pair and for this massive amount of um, uh, hydrodynamic entanglement associated with these giant shells of Alice and Bob. Okay, let's come to another subject. Wormholes grow with time. That is believed to have its roots quantum mechanically, at least I believe it, I don't know if you believe it, uh, in the um, idea that the complexity of states grows with time. The wormhole volume, the wormhole size, 
has been identified with the complexity of the quantum state as it evolves, I'll assume you know about that, and that that evolution, the tendency of uh, complexity to increase is what Adam and I call the second law of complexity. All right, I draw the two sides of the uh, relationship here. On the top is the growth of wormholes. On the bottom is a sort of iconic figure showing the growth of um, complexity. I won't explain this in any great detail. The only thing that I will explain is on the top diagram, no, yeah, okay, let's go slow. Here's the wormhole before it expands, before it grows. Once it's formed, it starts to grow. Its growth is thought to be connected with the growth of complexity and the relationship, this is the uh, complexity volume relationship, the complexity grows as the volume of the wormhole divided by LADS times the Newton constant in the bulk. Okay. That's the way the complexity is expected to grow. You can write this in terms of action if you like, but the formula uh, is the same. Okay, how are we going to convert this to an operational measurable thing that we might do in the laboratory? What I suggest, this is the simplest thing, is that we look at correlation functions at the two ends of the wormhole, at the two black holes, well, at the two shells, in the neighborhood of the two shells. We look at the correlation function of some kind of fields in the neighborhoods of the shells. If the shells were infinitely far from each other, way, way far away, and there was no entanglement, we would expect correlation functions to be basically zero. Why? Because there's just too far to go from one to the other in order to establish a good correlation. On the other hand, if there's a wormhole connecting them, then there's a short path to go from one to the other, and that short path could mediate correlation, and so we would expect correlation to be large, or at least not negligibly small. In fact, we know that for the thermofield double state, the correlation between fields on both sides is relatively large. We can either say that's because of entanglement, or we can say that's because there's an Einstein-Rosen bridge, which is short. What happens as the wormhole starts to grow? As the wormhole starts to grow, we would expect the correlation to get smaller. The correlation would get smaller because the wormhole is getting longer, as simple as that. Uh, we could go back to Mark Van Ramsdonk's analysis of similar things. As the wormhole grows, we would expect correlations to diminish. So let me give you two quick theories about how the correlation diminishes. The first is a kind of general relativity description. I'm, we don't need much general relativity. We just think of the wormhole as a kind of waveguide. It's a waveguide whose radius is of order LADS, the ADS radius, that means something in, uh, in Alice's shell. And the length of the wormhole is basically the time that the, uh, that the thermal field double has been allowed to evolve. It's grown proportional to time, and basically the, uh, the mass of, I guess you would call it the Kaluza-Klein mass inside that, uh, that um, waveguide would be of order one over LADS. What would you expect the correlation to be between the two sides? Roughly e to the minus m times t, which is e to the minus t over LADS. I believe this is probably the right answer. I don't know that anybody's ever calculated it for massless uh, excitation. Steve, has anybody calculated that? You, you, you don't know the answer, though. I think this must be the answer. It's the only thing I can think of. Anyway, let's assume it. Somebody should calculate it. Okay, let me give you a completely different theory. This theory is based on either tensor networks or circuits, quantum circuits. The left-hand side and the right-hand side are connected by a quantum circuit, the quantum circuit that creates the thermal field double or the evolved thermal field double. Um, the total number of gates in that circuit is, or the minimum number of gates that it would take to create that pair of states, or that state, would be called the complexity C. On the other hand, the number of gates that each qubit sees, that a single qubit sees, would be the complexity divided by the number of qubits, and that would be C over S. That's how many gates each qubit going along sees. 
Let's assume that each time a gate acts, it degrades the, uh, the correlation a little bit, that the correlation diminishes a little bit every time a gate acts. Then we might expect that the correlation between the two ends to go as e to the minus complexity divided by s, the number of gates that each, uh, each qubit experiences. That, uh, that would be my guess. Now we use complexity equals volume divided by LADSG. We use volume is equal to the area of the wormhole times the time, and we use that the entropy is the area divided by G, and we find that C over S is just T over LADS. In other words, we get the same answer for the correlation if we think quantum mechanically in terms of complexity and entropy, or if we think in general relativistically in terms of a growing wormhole uh, whose length is of order time. There's another example of similarity or identification between things which are quantum mechanical and things which are general relativistic. I think, uh, I'm not sure. Well, the, the, tr the trouble is that, the, that that gets into trouble. The, 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 in many cases, the extremal geodesic falls into the singularity, so that can't be the right no, I mean answer. The extremal one that connects the two points, which by definition does not fall into the singularity. It does fall into the singularity. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. It does. So that can't be the answer. Um, Steve knows much more about this than I do. Uh, so to, uh, in some sense, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But for massless particles, I'm not sure exactly how you uh, attack it. What's that? You have it for me? Yeah, I don't either. So I looked it up. I couldn't find it in the greater works of Stanford and uh, Schenker and friends. Okay, so in Alice's laboratory, we can try to think of the growing wormhole as a thing which is dictating and controlling the way correlation functions shrink with time. I don't know if this is the best kind of correlation function to use. It might be that various kinds of out-of-time order correlators, and I, I don't really know, but this is at least one thing you could do in Alice and Bob's laboratory to detect the fact that the wormhole is growing. Okay. One thought is there's no really need to build shells. You can use quantum computers. We can use quantum computers which are built, <laughs> we can make a shell of quantum computers instead of a shell of atoms, or we could just um, build a quantum computer which had similar output or similar behavior to what we expect for these shells, but maybe just even simpler than that. Um, for example, here are two entangled quantum circuits, two entangled quantum computers. If you can build a quantum computer, you can build two of them. And if you can build two of them, you can entangle them. Now, can you really do this in the laboratory? I don't know, you'd have to ask a laboratory a person. But I don't see any obstruction to being able to, uh, to entangle the two uh, quantum computers. All right. So there's two entangled quantum computers. What could we do with them? Well, we could do quantum teleportation through them. We could do quantum teleportation through the chaotic uh, channel associated with, uh, with the evolution of the quantum computer. Same deal. I won't even describe it. The picture is essentially the same. You send something in. You uh, connect the two sides by uh, random classical information. And at a later time, something pops out. Pops out means it becomes disentangled from the other things. And uh, you get to teleport something through the wormhole. You can explore the wormhole. In this case, you would know what's coming in. You're not sending an unknown thing from one side to the other. You know what's coming in, but you modify a little bit, the, uh, and maybe in some unknown way, the initial thermal field double. And what comes out the other end should be able to tell you, I saw an extra photon, or I got kicked by a donkey, or whatever sat on by an elephant. It was supposed to be a political joke, but it didn't work. <laughs> okay. 
All right, so I just point that out. Okay, one other thing you could do, similar again, is you could look at correlation functions of qubit operators as time goes on and measure them and, in fact, detect do they fall off as e to the minus complexity over s. Of course, you'd have to have tools for computing complexity. Roughly speaking, uh, we can make some estimates of it and we can check that the correlation function behaves the way we think it should. Uh, and that would then be satisfying, I think, and it would be laboratory uh, experiments testing things which are very close to gravitational things. All right, what is gravity really? Gravity has to do with apples falling. I've never mentioned apples yet, and we've been <laughs> half an hour into this uh, seminar. So let's talk about apples falling. Apples fall, but not too fast, and I'll quantify that in a moment. Also, things scramble. That's a quantum mechanical thing, but also not too fast. I want to relate those two facts. Uh, do I have another five minutes? Yeah. I, although, oh, okay, good. All right, good. All right, how in, let's say, ADS, CFT, or in Alice's shell, or whatever, do we represent an apple? Well, we can apply an operator, a W operator, uh, not exactly at the boundary. Well, yes, at the boundary, but perhaps uh, smeared a little bit over the boundary. That corresponds to inserting the apple a little ways in. And then and the operator W is an apple creation operator. We can run the thing forward. We can run it backward. If we run it forward, it falls through the horizon. If we run it backward, it also falls through the horizon. I'll mainly be interested in running forward. But um, what do we mean by saying that there is a gravitational attraction of the apple to the black hole? We mean that there's a mass times an acceleration. Well, that's not quite good enough. We're doing relativistic physics now, so let's do the relativistic version. We mean that there's a force which results in a time derivative of the radial component of the momentum. I can work this out. We can compute what the gravitational force is on an object just above the horizon of a black hole. That's not hard to do. And you can compute, and here's what you find. You find at least asymptotically in time, at late time, and that's what I'm interested in now for the moment, the momentum increases asymptotically as e to the time, but the time is the Rindler time. The Rindler hyperbolic angle, the dimensionless Rindler time. There's a, uh, there's a number out in front of the whole thing, the initial uh, energy of the, or, or the mass of the thing or whatever, but P, the momentum, due to falling, or that's what I'll identify as falling, goes as e to the omega and grows exponentially as you get toward the, toward the horizon. Okay, what quantum mechanical thing do we know that might be able to represent this p going e to the omega? What quantity in just quantum mechanics or the quantum mechanics of a chaotic system do we expect to grow exponentially with time? Here's a hint. The hint is that e to the omega also happens to be e to the 2 pi over beta times the Schwarzschild time. And you recognize there, of course, the Yapanov exponent that, uh, that um, Alexei talked about this morning. e to the omega is e to the 2 pi over beta times t. And so we might conclude from this uh, that, uh, that, well, okay, we might conclude from this that what's growing, the momentum, is in fact related and in fact is equal to, I believe, uh, the operator size. The operator size as defined earlier by, um, by Alexei. That's the thing which grows exponentially like that and I wanna take that very seriously. That infalling momentum is operator size. We've seen that, before. well, okay, here's, uh, here's, this is the same picture that, uh, that Alexei drew earlier. This is, the, what, what did you call it, um, the growth of the operator? Uh, uh, no, uh, this is the growth, this is the thing you call the growth of the, 
I don't know, maybe I called it the growth of the operator. Yeah, right. Actually, it wasn't me. It was Roberts and Stanford. Uh, that this is an SYK version of it. In the SYK version of it, an incoming, let's say, a single, uh, single fermion operator. We might take for W a single fermion, uh, an apple being represented by a single uh, fermion. The operator grows with time, and it grows exactly in this fashion, e to the 2 pi over beta t, uh, and grows exponentially. That's an example of the growth of size. Another thing is that the size and the complexity, the growth of complexity of the operator are closely related. You can read about it in the paper by Roberts and Stanford and myself. In particular, the size of the operator is the time rate of change of the complexity. That's something you can work out. And so, oh, here's some other examples. Other examples coming from other places. Another situation where you can see size growing as things fall toward the horizon is in string theory. This is a Monte Carlo simulation of string growth that was done by myself and my colleague Klebanoff which was aided by Marek Karliner with some computer sim uh, simulations. This is actually the growth of a string as it falls toward the horizon of a black hole, a horizon of a rindless space. And in fact, what you find is that the length of string, which is also a measure of the size of the string, also grows as e to the omega. All of these examples are examples of something that's called branching diffusion, and uh, they're all of common origin. In fact, branching diffusion occurs in all holographic theories, BFSS matrix theory. There you manifestly see that the number of D0 brains, the size of the operator, is equal to the momentum of the, uh, the, momentum of the infalling object. Yang-Mills loop equations, migdal mckinko uh, equations, you again see that this kind of branching diffusion takes place. In quantum circuits, it happens. It's the Hayden-Preskill um, growth uh, that, uh, that is also called scrambling. So here's a suggestion then. First of all, assume that radial momentum really is operator size. This one then suggests that the gravitational force or the growth of the momentum is a manifestation of the tendency of complexity to increase. In other words, the second law of complexity at least in the neighborhood of a black hole. I find that interesting, this correspondence between a gravitational thing and a quantum mechanical thing, the quantum mechanical thing being the growth of complexity. Last thing, I'm about finished, but let me point something out now. If I look at how things fall through a horizon, what I find is there are various possibilities. First of all, the fastest the thing can fall through the horizon is if it's moving toward the horizon with the speed of light. In other words, a light signal falling through the horizon. In that case, you find that P really does grow just as e to the omega, if you work it out. In fact, any time-like trajectory which goes through the horizon has the same behavior. P goes as e to the omega. The other possibility is that a signal does not go through the horizon. It just fails to be able to get up enough steam to pass through the horizon. You'd have to, re you'd have to re keep it from going through the horizon, of course, in which case P will always be less than e to the omega or will grow less rapidly than e to the omega. And so it would follow that causality would require, or just this relativistic picture would require that P is always, or always grows less rapidly, as rapidly or less rapidly than e to the omega. Compare that with the fast scrambling bound. The fast scrambling bound is a statement that the Yapanov exponent is always less than or equal to 2 pi over beta. Given the relationship between Rindler time and uh, Schwarzschild time, the fast scrambling bound is equivalent to the relativistic, quote. well, I, no, it, it, no, no, it's, it's too strong to say it's equivalent to. It parallels, it parallels the relativistic causality bound. That seems to me interesting. And another example of something which on the gravitational side, namely the falling of apples, is essentially similar to or parallel to a purely quantum mechanical effect 
namely the Maldusein Ashenko Stanford bound, which I think in some sense doesn't even mention uh, gravity. It's a bound on all possible systems on the behavior of the growth of scrambling. So that, um, those are three examples. Gravitational phenomena, traversable wormholes, the quantum phenomena associated with it, quantum teleportation through a chaotic channel, the laboratory protocol, if you had a quantum computer uh, of, of appropriate uh, entanglement, various quantum, uh, the quantum protocols uh, for, um, for teleportation. The growth of the black hole interior, that's the quantum phenomena is the second law of quantum complexity and the laboratory protocol would be measuring the time dependence of correlations. Falling, just ordinary gravitation. Uh, the second law of quantum complexity or fast scrambling, again, seems to govern it. And of course, the laboratory protocol would be measuring out of time order correlation functions. Uh, there are many more. Obviously, this theme can go on and on. There are things I can think of involving Hawking radiation, all kinds of interesting things that do have these kind of parallels which would allow them to be explored in a laboratory equipped with, with um, uh, quantum computers. I think that's all I had to say. Oh no, it's not quite. Yeah, okay, back to hammers and uh, stethoscopes. Let me compare all of this, Alice's whole story here, with another story that she might have tried to do, namely to simulate the standard model. Forget gravitation. She would say, I can simulate the standard model on a crystal or on a crystal of, um, of uh, computers. Uh, just the you know, ordinary lattice uh, gauge theory on a lattice. I can make observers on the inside of this lattice made up out of quarks and gluons and so forth. I can communicate with them by tapping the lattice and sending uh, signals in. I can read out what's going on with my stethoscope. It's, is this real? Is what's going on in the crystal real? Of course what's going on in the crystal is quite real. And in fact, you could open up the crystal, you could stop the time evolution, open up the crystal, and see that in the inside, these people are really there, or these objects, or these protons, these hadrons, or whatever, the neutrinos, they're really there. So it's very real. Um, let me compare that with Alice's shell. Here's Alice's shell again. Somewhere there's a bulk associated with this. Alice says, I'm gonna open up that shell and see what I find inside. The answer is she finds nothing inside. The bulk is not the interior of the shell in the laboratory. In fact, the bulk is nowhere in the laboratory. It's a pure manifestation of entanglement and complexity. You might think, you might call it imaginary, but I wouldn't call it imaginary because we did all these experiments that detected that it's really there. Um, it's a magic trick, sort of like a hologram, except better. So my view is that the thing we really call gravity is not disconnected and different than what's going on in Alice's laboratory. It's just a version of the same thing. Hydrodynamics of massive amounts of entanglement. One more point. I said, uh, I, said I was only going to do one more point, and I've done three more points already, but one more point which I think is, is interesting. You can ask in hydrodynamics, you can ask how many particles do you really need before you start to see hydrodynamic behavior? Where is the crossover between just ordinary particles and hydrodynamic behavior? Is it 10 particles? Put 10 particles in a box. Is that enough to see some hydrodynamic behavior? Well, I, I suspect the answer is yes, 10 particles. But certainly 1,000 particles is certainly more than enough to see some elements of hydrodynamic behavior. It's a very interesting question to my mind. Where would we see the crossover? between what we might call ordinary quantum mechanics of small number of qubits, which we would probably not think of uh, as a general relativistic uh, system, and gravity, the crossover between um, massive amounts of entanglement 
that would define a hydrodynamic behavior. I think it's a relatively small number of qubits, 10, 15, 20, 25, maybe 100. And if that's true, that means you can explore the crossover between ordinary quantum mechanics and gravitational behavior on a relatively modest quantum computer. I don't think you need n of order 10 to the 10th or something like that. Anyway, that's my message. Thank you. <laughs>